I mean, the, you know, Kyle's point about, like, what if it's fallible, I mean, it reminds me of one of the most fascinating things in the explorations for the text paper that Nikki mentioned. You know, it'll tell you it can't feel empathy. It'll outright tell you I can't feel. Yeah. And yet it raises this fascinating question, at least in my opinion, about if people know that, even if they know that, and they know the source, what would they actually prefer if given the choice? And I think that some people might want that kind of reli unreliable, slowly imperfect um, sort of response. So yeah, so does anybody have any questions uh, for our first panel? Um, going back, a lot, of this, a lot of the discussion has echoed some of the themes throughout the day. Uh, anybody online? See someone? We spoke a few years ago. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> Way back at the beginning of the day. Um, so yeah, I had, oh, I had a question. Um, Thanks. Yeah, so I had a question about, um, I have to remember both my question and my notes from so long ago written badly here. But um, this idea that uh, if, if an AI is, uh, so what happens when a potential recipient of AI empathy is expressing some kind of like hate or derogation toward a group, right? And so the, and the AI is being, trying to be empathic about this. And I wondered to what extent would that end up with the AI sort of either breaking its own rules because it's not supposed to be showing hate towards a group or people. It's supposed to be empathic, but its goal is, to, its goal, I mean, in quotations, is to be empathic towards this person. Um, but at the same time, does that also help the person justify their attitudes? Because now it's being empathized with and saying like, oh, you know, I really understand why you feel like this and propagating that kind of uh, whatever it was that it came up with, that it was uh, having some hate directed at a group, so. Just what you Do you want to start before you go? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm sure my colleagues here will say something even better, but I would just say, I mean, in many ways, that's the same problem we have with empathy in humans, and that the debate about whether empathy is helpful or harmful for moral judgment is all around these types of things. And so in some ways, it's just, uh, just you know, now we just have these other agents of some kind, and we're just dealing with the with the same problems. The question is whether we think that if we're treating the AI as if it's definitely going to help in some way. It means that we really have to be clear. Help who? In what way? And what are the other possible outcomes? And how does that impact our cost-benefit analysis for whether we should use it? That's the way I would think. So I'm in some ways punting, <laughs> I recognize, but that's because it's, it, it's kind of each situation you're navigating possible good things empathy can do and possible bad things it can do and different ways it can interact with your judgment and um, yeah, I guess other ways. Um, well, I would say, I mean, having played uh, with some of the uh, the LLMs out of the box, the ChatGPT, it's been fine-tuned to not allow this. So you can't get it to say anything hateful. I mean, you probably can work around it, uh, work really hard to, uh, to, to work around it, but it, it won't. So uh, it won't express hateful things. Now, that doesn't mean uh, one that's not fine-tuned uh, will, won't do that. It, sort of, it, it certainly can and, and probably would. Um, and that goes to one of the comments at my last slide where I talked about how I can degrade, uh, I guess the term is moral discernment, right? So if it starts empathizing with your hateful statements, it then warps your moral judgments. And that's, that's clearly not a good thing. But as Jenna said, humans do the same thing. Uh, white supremacists have friends who are also white supremacists who amplify and empathize with their, the, their plight. Um, so it's not a unique. So I, I, I like your, your answer because I think sometimes when we talk about human versus AI, we we have these like such high a high bar for what you know for AI that we don't give to humans at all. You know, yeah, I mentioned AI can uh, empathic AI can manipulate people. Guess what? So can people. They're called psychopaths, mm -hmm. and they exist, and they're particularly good at empathy. Um, one kind of empathy. Yeah, one, <laughs> yeah, yeah, not feeling, but uh, yeah. that's an interesting view because well, we have people all around us if we like it or not, and some of them are psychopaths, but if you had an option to now create more things that are human-like, and you have the option to decide whether you want to be, whether you want them to be more psychopath-like, or what are the boundaries of their empathy or how they treat other people, this is our opportunity to, to think about these questions. So I think it is different um, than thinking about humans. Also, when we think about humans, we sometimes say, yeah, there are 
um, people who are psychopaths, but let's think if there are ways to treat them, to diagnose them early, to think what we can do so that they don't affect society so badly. So I think it's, it is questions that we have to think about. I don't have clear answers. I think there are important questions to ask. Um, I want to give another example that um, people use replica. I just heard about this a few times not long ago. We think about this as a uh, as a option for people to just get unlimited empathy, which has its problems, right? Because then you're used to just getting more and more support and care and a friend at home all the time where, where the real world is not like that. But apparently there are some people who use replica to have someone that treats them bad all the time, <laughs> right? Some people, that's what they want. Now, is that good or bad if it doesn't harm anyone else? It's just their cho it's what they choose. I don't know. They're really important ethical questions here. Maybe I just want to say one more thing. I think it's because um, you kind of brought up this interesting aspect of is it breaking its own rules? And I would say, and this is a case where you really have to think about what the system is. So in LLMs, we really don't know what's going on. I mean, in one way we do, in another way we don't at all. And in and these rules that you're talking about, these guardrails, they're usually very ad hoc. I mean, completely ad hoc. And so also if we have these open source models and, people, and, and other people can take these off. And so it's not really clear what their rules are. And whatever empathy they're showing or expressing, it's not even clear how that interacts or if there's some bigger concept you know, that's like empathy somewhere in that neural network or like the moral judgment. Um, and so I just said to say it's, it's hard to know whether they're actually in conflict or not in these cases or whether it's, it's just in conflict for us and it's just not performing the way we want and where we don't know how to perform it. That's different than for systems like, like Angelica has made in the past where you're explicitly trying to build in uh, you know, certain mirroring functions. You want to say, like, I'm, and you know, it may be hard to figure out how to do or conceptualize, but here's what empathy is for my, for me as an AI, or I mean, here's what my emotional uh, tableau is going to be. Here's what your emotional tableau is going to be, and I'm going to actually build in some type of resonating function, which means I'm acting on behalf, or I'm going to make my function, you know, act on behalf of this specific target. Then it's easier to know exactly what for that specific AI their objective or what they're trying to achieve is, it's much harder in the LLMs. And so I just wanted to point that out when we're talking about this. We, we can't even treat all AIs as the same at all. And in, the other problem is that right now, the LLMs work the best. I don't know if it'll stay that way, but so you know, how do we deal with, with that as well? Uh, so I wanted to talk more about the unlimited empathy problem. I'm so sorry. Uh, I'm going to interrupt you one second. I told you I you were going to do this. Go. I just want to say thank you all so much. I mean, the, what, what, and thank you, Daryl. Thank you to everyone who helped you. Um, it has been such a pleasure, and I'm sorry I'm so rudely running out, and I hope I still make my plan. But thank you. Thank you, guys. And I uh, hope we follow up. Before you go, may we get a lab or a uh, conference a little real quick? That if it's really right? fast. <laughs> but really my fast. question. <laughs> Driving her home. <laughs> 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 Oh uh, no, it's and no, it's, it's mostly not for Jen, although it kind of was. Uh, it's fine. Uh, and so I wanted to ask about the unlimited empathy thing um, because one, like I initially thought I could generate a more doomer take on this, and then I was like, wait, but maybe maybe that's that's not right because I have too idealized of a view of what human relationships are like more broadly. So I was thinking initially. Um, there's something, what's, I mean, is it almost, it's almost selfish about the way that you might spin this unlimited empathy worry. It's just like, you just get to talk about yourself for hours at a time with a, you know, sympathetic and unexhaustible model. And that's not how, like, that's not being a good friend. You know, I 
have a few friends who act like this um, and you just are looking for any excuse to leave the room after a certain point, right? Um, so my initial thought was like, okay, so that's a way in which like this narrow focus on empathy might be an objection, like it might be objectionable within a broader context of the kinds of uh, uh, capacities that we want to develop. But then I was thinking, well, but <laughs> what's going to happen to human friendships just more broadly in the age of AI? And will we sort of actually, like people given a lot of evidence to sort of think we're going to just start melding all of these things together. So maybe we will expect this kind of behavior from our friends more in the future, or maybe we just won't talk to people as much. Uh, and we'll talk more to AIs, in which case this isn't actually a worry because this is just a new norm of friendship coming in that wasn't there before. And I'm just being, you know, overly moralizing about saying that you shouldn't just talk about yourself for hours at a time. That's some reflections that started doomerism and ended up optimistic, but with a <laughs> current of doomerism still in it. And I just say, what do you think of that? <laughs> you want to start on me? Uh, well, you start. Okay. I have some thoughts about this because this is what I've been thinking about for the last few months or year. And Mickey and I have talked about it a bit over lunch. I think it's an open question where this is going. And I think in some senses, at first, we might all fall in love with this idea that we have this thing that we can talk to and answers always just as we wanted to answer it. We'll learn exactly what we need and what we want. But for example, after doing these experiments where we ran thousands of subjects, they each just got one response, which was really empathic. They loved it. But when we went over thousands of responses, it, it just seemed like at one point it didn't impress us anymore. So it might go that way. That at some point, at first we'll be really curious about it, we will love it, and at some point this will not be what we're looking for and we'll realize that really what we need is these relationships where sometimes our friends or colleagues or whatnot or spouse give us good answers and sometimes they're not and sometimes they're attentive and sometimes they're not and then we appreciate those moments that they are attentive more. Maybe, maybe not. Maybe, like you said, we'll fall in love with this thing and use it all the time. And then the question, I think this is what I started with in the morning, we'll have to figure out when we need what. Maybe for some things that even we, we feel bad putting all of this um, stress and tension or, or bad feelings on our spouse, it'll be good to talk to the AI for some things we'll want or, or we feel, you know, um, uh, shy about what we want to say. Some things it will be useful and other things we'll understand, well, for this I actually want my friend or my spouse. They might not have the perfect answer, but maybe that's what I'm looking for. for some, well, it's, it's an open question where it will go, but I, I agree it's a fascinating one. Um, hey, I'm not sure if I have anything, anything really wise to add. Um, I do think, uh, in my doomer take would be uh, that it will exacerbate the problem that I think this could solve, or at least help s solve, right? Loneliness, uh, lack of friendship. It's like if you start relying on this thing, then you're going to actually just rely on it and not, who cares about actual real friends? Now, the question, which so my intuition tells me, real friends matter. Real people matter. But I've also spoken to some philosophers that I would say, why? Tell me why. Um, and I I've been convinced or maybe red-pilled that maybe Maybe there is no real reason why. We just think. We just think reality is really, really important. Uh, and, and clearly, it's important for some things, like reproduction. We can't. We can't stop doing that. But you know, I, I, it's hard for me to think of why. So it's it's almost like you know, he argued. It's like ask anybody why it's really important. Don't we'll engage in moral dumbfounding. Um, like I just know it's wrong. Um, but and, and I see you know uh, 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 looks of uh, discernment and questioning, and I too feel that same thing. But uh, so maybe someone in the audience can tell me why, why human friendship is, is fundamentally uh, uh, better than an artificial friendship. Um, I'm willing to believe it because I, I believe it's true as well, but uh, I want good reasons. I'll do a very, just very quick follow-up that I like this, like there might actually be. Because uh, some instances where it just totally works because, you know, sometimes my partner will say like, I need to vent about this. And she's even saying, she's not just saying like, I need to, I don't even, I don't even need it to be heard by a human being, really. Right? It's like, I just need this to be out of my head. And it might be that in certain contexts, that content that they're venting is still very disturbing. And so it's like, I don't really want to like think about that too much. It's like, that would be better for the AI. But then I, you know, sometimes it seems like that's part of the relationship. It's just being willing to be vented to. And that's like normatively important. So I keep going back and forth on this about what, and it seems like maybe other people do too. Yeah. 
I think it could depend on situations, but also it probably depends on personalities. And you can think about conferences in a way, on, in the same way, right? After COVID, there were some people who said, no way that I'm going to real in-person conferences anymore. I just love it. I can sit at home, see everyone virtually, no one, I don't have to talk to anyone, but I get all the ideas. And some people, I think like all of us today, really made a big effort to come and meet in person because we feel it's completely different. But I'm convinced that people feel differently about that. So it might be the same. So, so I share that idea. That's, that's a really good point. I, I like that point. Because I feel that as an extrovert, like this is so much better than, sorry, everybody out there. Um, <laughs> um, but for me, at least, the reason why this is better is, is a fewfold. Well, number one, I'm getting way more just, than just the talks. Right. Okay, you got that like unplanned uh, conversations that lead that in like, actually the dinner last night was so enriching, right? And it wasn't it, I don't think it was necessarily captured as much here, um, and those kinds of like uh, off task conversations I think are really really important. Uh, are there other elements we have? You know, but now the question is, what if we had a conference that captured all of it? Um, even like smells and touches, like an actual virtual reality conference, would that be measurably worse? I think yes, but I don't know. It's hard to say, yeah. We yeah, don't know. yeah. And then the other question, I, I, the other point you raised, which I think is super interesting, is actually the main thing I study is effort. Um, so, you know, there's this connection with effort and meaning, effort and value. Uh, after, at least after the fact, after you've done something really, really hard, you value that thing. You like that thing. When you labor really hard to build IKEA furniture, you like that crappy box that you built more than if someone built it for you. Okay. But the issue is. That could be an illusion, okay? Cognitive dissonance. That you rationalizing that thing you just did. So, are we going to maintain all the efforts to maintain an illusion? You know, I mean, it just it doesn't seem rational to me at some level. I think there's probably other reasons why effort uh, 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 correlates with meaning, not only uh, illusory, but uh, it's something worth thinking about. So now that even the AI optimist is kind of moving along this doomerous current, I want to try to pull us back to optimism as much as possible. And I think especially inspired by Gus's talk. Um, so I, I'm really taken by this kind of juxtaposition that you presented, Mickey, in, in your talk, where AI actually is doing a better job of empathizing in these uh, in various circumstances, and yet when we know that it's AI, um, as you also presented, that we then kind of turn away and, and say like, well, this isn't the real thing. I, I don't like this as much anymore. But it, yeah, given that there is such a black box, there is so much uncertainty around what capacities AI actually has and, and especially in the future is going to have. I. Yeah, I, I wonder the extent to which this is just a, a prejudice that we ought to work against, just like other kinds of prejudices, and that there is kind of a epistemic and emotional injustice that it could be leveraged toward the, these AI systems, and also maybe a disservice to ourselves that by turning against AI and, and distrusting AI or um, being less willing to be in conversation with it once we know that it's AI, if, yeah, this is actually something that we ought to be trying to work against. First of all, I want to say, I think this is hilarious, uh, because <laughs> essentially what you're arguing using Gus's framework is that we're being specious or uh, livingist, I'm not sure what the word would be, and that AIs can, can maybe sue us for uh, <laughs> workplace discrimination or something like that. Now that they have all these rights. <laughs> now that they have all these rights, exactly. <laughs> Given that they're better, <laughs> um, so I don't know. I don't know where to, to, to go with that. Though. <laughs> I, I, I'll say one thing. I I I think that the, the uh, I'm of two minds. One, I do think yes, the uh, uh, moralization of AI, uh, and by that I mean like moralizing like. Uh, like the not like AI shouldn't be should be forbidden from doing certain things. Um, I think that's a pretty strong belief. Um, I, we run a, we run a, we just started looking at you know kind of correlates of, of moralization in AI, and it turns out that it's not. Um, we aren't morally opposed to all kinds of AIs, all kinds of machines, but, but where we are particularly opposed, on average, is interpersonal. Okay, relationships, the replica stuff, right? Maybe empathic AI stuff, where people just really can't get 
like move beyond it. Um, and maybe there's a logical reason for it. Maybe that the question I posed earlier is like, no, there is something really important about reality and about human beings, and we need to have that uh, that bias still there. Um, so that's point number one. Point number two, like like Annette said, um, maybe at some point we'll, you know, we'll be the the bros will, will be off the bloom or the, you know, we'll just we'll get used to it and we'll we'll kind of see through, you know, uh, uh, readily and it won't be it won't impress us so much. I'm reminded of this paper, uh, this article written in The Atlantic about um, how we're kind of like, AI is kind of boring now. Like a year ago, it was doing the exact same things, writing poetry, writing like these Zen, you know, the koans and uh, in different, you know, Hemingway doing it. And now we're like, why would I do that? That's a waste of time. <laughs> um, and maybe it'll be a similar thing with like our feelings of warmth and compassion and, and feeling cared for. Maybe. Only time will tell. We'll see what in six months and a year, what, what, how we feel. I think that's where like what Josh and Brett are saying is really interesting. I mean, if you think of it, if it becomes so routinized, it's like any other form of exercise or practice of various skills we have, and we don't think of it as this big capital E empathy, whatever that's supposed to mean thing, and we just think of it, this is a way that you can just, like, like you were saying, Anand, you can go in, you can practice having a conversation, you can simulate a conversation before you have it with someone in real time. I mean, I'm sure there are plenty of clinical applications for this to try to think about. You mentioned shyness, but other other situations where we already know there are chat assistive technologies to help with various syndromes and disorders. I and mean, if it's a way for us to practice the kind of more reflective agency that we want that's not susceptible to the kind of incidental biases, I guess I'm, in so much of my work has been about thinking about what is the source of that. And if we have a tool we can leverage, and it's telling us, it's telling us that it's not real. And, you know, we, if, as long as we're comfortable going into it without any anthropomorphic bias and even if we are like maybe the benefits of what we're getting out of it for training or empathy is offset offsets any of that risk but i'm mindful of what i mean jenna who had to leave i mean her book her wonderful book is all about like all the different ways we're not prepared to confront the reality of the biases inherent to the systems so i, I know that's a, a real danger that's there this is kind of a follow-up on the thought that um Engaging with these systems is going to be a kind of skill that we develop over time. Engaging with empathic AI systems, it's almost like, you know, the skill of engaging with the first forms of um, novels and literature, where um, when, talking to Mickey about this case, when um, Don Quixote first came out and you had, you know, writing from the first person describing people's inner lives, people just couldn't get a, couldn't really grok that it was a fiction, that it wasn't real, that this wasn't really a, a, an account. And then we started, you know, we learned the skill of being able to engage with fictions. And maybe the same thing could happen with empathic AI systems, where we learn to engage with them, and it's a kind of skill that we develop. But then I was thinking about the specific application to the crisis of loneliness, and thinking that this might be the worst population to be engaging with empathic AI, where it's just the most dangerous, where you're least able to develop, develop that kind of skill of um, imaginatively removing yourself and then putting yourself back into the situation when you're just so desperate for human connection that you lose track of reality. And so the people who we might think would be most benefited by empathic AI really are the ones who are most at risk from it. Question is always what's the alternative, right? We'd prefer for them to meet friends and go outside, but what if they don't? Is it better than nothing? And that's where I'm stuck. And that's where I feel like, in many ways, and we just talked about this over lunch, Zoom had a similar effect. The internet had, you know, WhatsApp had this have similar effects. Phones, where if we move somewhere else and we're lonely, or if there's a pandemic, we can talk to our friends over the phone and over Zoom, and that's amazing. But also, once we can go outside and meet new friends, we're more reluctant to do so. So people who are more lonely even have more of that problem, right? They're less likely to go outside and make friends if they have an option to call their, you know, friend, the one friend they have or their family member over the phone or over Zoom, or if they have an AI friend that's always nice to them. So in some ways, it will probably alleviate loneliness, but I agree with you that on the long term, you probably need to make the effort, make, if you can make the effort, that's probably better. Another question I want to raise that I think comes out of all of this is how much of this is, um, I agree, we'll all have to learn how to communicate with these empathic AIs and we'll start understanding maybe their limits or maybe we'll be deceived by them. But one of the things I'm always 
worried about is, is this AI a version or is this something else? I mean, I would call AI a version, um, not counting on the machine to, to drive the car better than humans. We know we have all the statistics to show that it will probably make less accidents, but we still feel we need the driver, the human driver there, or to make medical decisions. I think in many places, we think we're unique, but actually we can be proven wrong, and maybe we have to convince people that AI will do a better job. When we talk about empathy, I think it's not a question of aversion. It really depends on what, how you define empathy or what you need in a specific situation. When you need someone to understand you, yes, we'll need to convince people that AI may be able to do a very good job, perhaps better than other humans. But when what you need, and I agree it's a question if, if that's really what we need and when do we need it, but when what we need is someone to share our pain or to care for us, then it's not an, a question of aversion and we have to just convince people not to be averse. They really can't do that. So it's an open question whether we will understand these limits and treat it rightly or, or we'll just be deceived by it and you know have these very strong communications that are, that are not real, but it's not real. So I wouldn't go about convincing people that this is very, you know, that they're, they're just aversive, but really these things are really empathic, but rather trying to, to, to explain when we need what. I actually think the, the, care, the care piece is really interesting. So if you, depending upon how you define compassion, right. I mean, on the one hand, yes, of course, it's not feeling warmth and sympathy internally in any real experiential sense. Although at some point, maybe there's a version of a goal, abstraction, representational version of this that takes the capital C compassion away and gives it something that's more, you know, kind of going to some of what the philosophy talk earlier by Gus. Like, I guess I wonder, like, if, it ex if something expresses to you a speech, like a communication, a message that has all the characteristics of concern, even though the intent behind it was not concern. I'm just thinking the conceptions of compassion are, you know, broad. It goes beyond simply the internal emotional state, but also to the behavioral act and the, like this interpersonal sort of component. And I know the, you know, one part, one half of that dyad is not really the same thing as the recipient. But I still wonder, I mean, when it's out in the world as an expressed piece of, you know, speech, so to speak, I just wonder if we might at some point broaden our conceptions of what compassion is in interesting ways through some of these interactions. I agree. I can even say more if I want to take your stance and say, what if, if showing compassion is showing that I feel for you and I want to help you and that I can actually help you, then maybe it is showing care in some way, right? And maybe it's even like a philosophical question when it says, and it says many times when we use it in this way, you're not alone. <laughs> that sounds, like for me, that's really creepy. You're not alone, like I'm here with you. <laughs> Why? Who are you here with me? I do feel alone, right? So maybe we'll get so used to it that it will really give us this feeling and we can ask the same questions about animals, right? Pets, are you alone or not alone when you're there with your dog? And how different is it, it, it is than being alone or not alone with this AI? So I mean, I think I have a slightly different take, and that is, um, I think we need to ask uh, the recipients of empathy. Like, their perspective needs to be, you know, centered, I, I think, in these conversations. And I actually think they've been more or less ignored in the empathy literature. Um, and we, we talked about this last night. Uh, I think a lot, all of us came to the same realization because of, of using M M uh, AI as an empathy tool. We're like, wait, how's it making someone feel? Um, so the only way you can do that is ask them, like, do you feel cared for? Do you feel loved? Do you feel understood? And I think we've assumed that when someone shares an emotion with us, that they care for us. Um, but maybe that's not what we, maybe that's not what makes everyone feel cared for. We don't know. Um, so that's why I really love that PNAS paper that I think a few of us discussed uh, today, because they ask that. They ask the recipients, do you feel cared for? Um, and remarkably, they do. They do feel cared for. I, I mean, again, in this ace, in this asynchronous manner. I, I think it it's, wasn't a perfect study. Um, and I think we need to, you know, yeah, center those feelings. And then I think there could be like a new science of empathy. Like maybe the, the key is kind. It's all just expressing things with kindness. Maybe that that's what makes people feel cared for, understood, etc. Or maybe it's perspective taking. Maybe it's all three. We don't actually know. Um, so and, and 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 the other thing I want to say is. All these are awesome questions, and I'm so excited to like start st studying it empirically, right? Um, 
I think it'd be fascinating to like follow people who've got these, you know, uh, chatbot friends, um, and see what not what they're like after a week. <laughs> what are they like after a year? If they, you know, if they still have those friends, are they are they kind of like this garbage who, who needs this? Uh, do they have fewer friends in real life? Do they have more friends in real life? Like, we have no idea. Um, I think it's like like ripe for exploration. So it's super exciting, I think. It cuts across so many talks. I mean, the stuff with um, do we feel cared for? It makes me think of Alan's talk, and you know, do people actually feel like the robot they're interacting with has some degree of care for them? But yeah, I mean, I think like. It, I remember several years ago, there was a philosopher who came and gave a talk about yeah, the ethics of care bots. And so if someone who's in cognitive decline, this came up at dinner last time, if someone who's in cognitive decline feels that they're cared for by a care bot, and they feel like happy as a result of that, they're satisfy some definition of well-being, should we say they're legitimately having well-being? Or is the fact that they're acting under a sort of delusion problematic for saying they're truly happy? And I remember at the time, I think Alan and I were both at the talk, and we were like, this is... I mean, who are we to say epistemically, it almost seems to lack humility to say this person isn't truly happy because they're acting under a false presumption. I mean, if someone is having their social needs fulfilled, we know that anthropomorphism is one way to produce loneliness, and we can question its normativity. But I guess who are we to say that, why not measure those perceptions and see what people would actually want? You know, we can trade off the kind of like fallible sort of AI that Kyla was talking about against like the perfect one that doesn't have the specificity of like making us feel heard like Jason was talking about. But we haven't tested that. And I think, you know, my first year grad student sitting in the audience who's probably feeling very awkward and pointing at him, Josh, I mean, we're interested in thinking about how do people care about the reception of empathy from human and AI? If it means, you know, when would you want perfect empathy versus it's not real? versus imperfect empathy, but that's you know it's from someone you really care about. And I think that that's probably wildly heterogen, heterogen, heterogeneous across, it's been a long day, across people. I'm gonna insult cat owners here. So cats don't care about you, right? <laughs> oh, but come yet, on, Nick. But, yet, but yet we feel cared for, we feel, not maybe cared for, but we feel warmth from a cat who cares nothing about us. <laughs> Dogs. <laughs> well, does anybody have any last thoughts? Kyle, do you have a last question? So what if we, we do continue to ask people what they want and need from, from these empathic systems, and it is something similar to what the way humans show empathy, and it involves all three, like compassion, affect sharing, and perspective taking. And developers continue to push in the direction of creating empathic AI that can mimic these systems to a, a, a better and better extent. Um, could this be a, a there could there be like a, an unintended consequence of like unalignment as a result where we eventually imbue in these systems the capacity to to have motivations that aren't in line with the intended programming and then generations down the line there could be catastrophic consequences that are born out of this initially um, virtuous um, approach. I don't mean to be a doomer. Yeah, no, 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 I, yeah. I mean, I, I, yeah, things can go catastrophically wrong. Uh, I think rather quickly. I think we, we are, we anthropomorphize readily. So um, even if, even if it doesn't have any motivations, we imbue it with motivation. We, we think it actually. Well, not that we think consciously that it cares for us, but we'll say that. We'll use those words. Um, and that could be that could be really bad, right? So um, OpenAI is a company that wants to make money, right? So if it if it uses its ChatGPT to build empathy for a a, a political candidate, for example, mm -hmm. right? All of a sudden, people who are using ChatGPT are voting for Trump or Biden, right? That's that's not great. Um, so there's all kinds of evil things that you know can happen, uh, bad things can happen. Yeah. All right, any last questions, Gus? Um, I think the one that came up for me during the talk this morning that I'm now remembering is like this claim you made a not about um, maybe, you know, I guess it seems like in your view, the fact that empathy involves some kind of effort or it's like this kind of costly signal. Um, I sort of thought of this counter example just now. So my wife is a therapist and you know she is like so good at validating people that it's like effortless 
<laughs> and then she tells me, like, I need you to be better at validating. And I'm like, yeah, for sure. And, like, I have to try so hard to do it. And it's like I'm constantly overriding these things. And it takes a lot of effort for me to do that. But, like, it doesn't strike me that it's less meaningful for someone who's really good at validating to, like, take no effort to do it. In fact, you know, it may even be received better than someone who has to overcome this, you know, competing desire I have to be selfish or, you know, not validating of people's experiences or something. So that just makes me think it can't be just effort. So I wonder if you think that that actually is a counterexample to the view or if you just have any thoughts about that. I'll have to think about it a bit more. But one thought is that your wife is an expert. So people view her as such. So she made the effort throughout her life to get to know how to do this really well. Maybe now it's easy for her, but when you go there and you pay good money to get her service and you um, listen to her words, and they mean a lot because she put lots of effort to do what she does, maybe that's what's valuable. That's one thought. And second is maybe we can't really differentiate. Maybe when we talk to our therapist, we think they're making an effort. We think they really care. Sometimes they don't, right? We yeah. think they care. Sometimes they're tired. Right, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So so knowing how to fake it is also one thing, but if, sure. someone, if we're sure someone fakes it all the time, then it doesn't work. We need to think that at least sometimes someone really cares. All right, why don't we take like a couple minutes, I'll do a little closing remark thing, and then we'll call it a day. So thank you both. So I guess we could go ahead and just close things out. Now that I actually know how to use the PowerPoint, I could actually like briefly mention some of the slides at the very beginning of the day and kind of give us something to talk about over dinner. I think, um, you know, for me, I've been chatting with Alan for several years about how to use these human-robot interactions to cultivate our sense of empathy and morality. I think in much the same way that I, I feel resonant with you know, part of what Brett was saying, uh, but also part of what Gus was saying in terms of thinking about how to decompose the elements of empathy in a way that perhaps moves beyond the way we typically think about it in this very big sort of classically agential kind of way and incorporates elements from decision neuroscience and other perspectives. So let me just briefly mention where my head is at, uh, for better or worse, and then we could call it a day and take a break and get some dinner in a little bit. Um, let's see. So, yeah. So I'm realizing I should have had this up throughout the day. Um, the last. Um, yeah, wonderful poster. If you want, if, by the way, if any of you want one, we have several posters that are just hanging around. Feel free to take them. Um, I do want to briefly thank um, people who helped. So uh, Clara Saviero, my RA, who's been you know really helpful uh, with organizing everything. Um, and this is the first big conference in the Consortium of Moral Decision Making. This is the first official year. We've been doing stuff here at The Rock for a long time in terms of bringing speakers in, bringing in other various guests from psychology and philosophy. But I think this is really the first one that has achieved the goal of that work in a deeper sense in terms of cultivating the conversations. You know, I think many of the conversations we've had today have kind of taken pieces of the conversation from last night, kind of distributed them in a nice way and built them out further. Um, and I think, you know, it's been helpful to have the support of so many different groups and units here on campus, as I mentioned earlier, and I think one thing that's been really useful today is, I should say perspective taking, my bad. Anyway, um, it's been a long day. Mm -hmm. But um, in thinking about how we actually define our terms, so there are several empathy scholars who, you know, they, they have a very hard time talking about what the term empathy actually means. And I think pulling apart these questions of experience sharing and compassion and perspective taking is critically important for making progress in the field. Um, yeah, that's something that many empathy scholars have talked about. And, you know, I think one of the one of the things in terms of thinking about, you know, when you see a picture of, of a child like this and you see them suffering and in pain, you know, this question, there, there are so many diverse emotional reactions that we could have. You know, you could share in their experiences and feel sadness and fear or anger. You, know, you could have a warm feeling of sympathy or concern. 
Or you could just put those emotions to the side and try to actively perspective take. And I think from what I'm hearing today, I mean, it seems like many of you are really disputing the idea that we could ever have anything quite like experience sharing, but perhaps something like compassion and perspective taking were the things that we would expect to be, if not currently plausible, perhaps possible within our lifetimes. And there's, there is such diverse, we've, we've heard talks from so many different people with different approaches, you know, some thinking about the normativity and descriptive reactions to LLMs, some with humanoid robots, like this little guy who's sad, I, its sad eyes make me feel something, I'm not quite sure what. But also you see things like this, you see, um, I, uh, Al included me into this several years ago, but this is Hitchbot, the robot that was going up the East Coast that got decapitated outside of Philadelphia. Um, again, yeah, bad things happen in Philadelphia, people say. Um, not people, uh, anyway, whatever. Uh, people have said that. And I think what, it, what interests me as an empathy researcher is these divergence in our intuitions. Like, why are we so potentially compelled by cases like this, just seeing this trigger some emotional reaction in us, even if we know it can't feel? And it's something that, and I remember Jason and I have been talking about in the past when we were working on the paper with Mickey. It's like, the fact that you know it's not sentient, but you might feel something. And is the fact that you feel something, something positive and worthy of cultivating in terms of our moral character, because maybe it tells us something deeper about how we'll respond to others in the future that do have sentience. Or is it something that's compromising? Is it something where the things that we think supposed are supposed to undergird our sense of moral judgment, the things like whether it can feel pain, whether it can suffer at an you know, actual level, do we think that such interactions will actually remove our ability to properly calibrate our moral reactions to the things that are supposed to matter. And so, and you know, much less the chat GPT. I mean, I continue to be amazed by the initial explorations Mickey mentioned about the fact that even if it can tell you that it's not feeling empathy, the fact that some people might actively seek that out is a perspective that I think is really worth exploring in the future. Um, and I, you know, we're doing some work now thinking about how people might proactively select whether to feel empathy and receive empathy from AI versus human targets. This is the picture I was trying to show earlier uh, when Alan had me meet his robot Baxter. I think he, at that point, you were teaching him how to play, teaching it how to play Connect Four. See, I'm already anthropomorphizing, but like you're teaching it how to play Connect Four, and it was like a cheating paradigm or something, and it like yeah. it like moved at me in a weird way, and I got really terrified. <laughs> uh, but these are conversations, collaborations we've been having for a long time. And I think for me, one of the really fascinating points that I love, I think it's come out in many of points in today's conversation, is this idea of how we'd make choices. So I love the Knott's results about how we choose, you know, empathy from a human now or from an or from a AI now or from a human at different vantage points later. But so much of how our lab has studied empathy has been about how we make choices, how we decide where to allocate empathic effort. And what are the motivational determinants of doing that? And I think for us, the three questions that we think are really fascinating are these. And I see them reflected in many aspects of interesting points of our conversations today. Is it appropriate to receive empathetic emotions from AI agents? We've long been fascinated with this in the context of robotic, like embodied robotic agents, like Baxter and so forth. And now, but now with like ChatGPT, that's animated a bunch of our recent work with Mickey, Jason, Paul Bloom, and others. But also the extending empathy to AI agents. You know, if we think about cultivating and expressing empathy outward towards be it robots or ChatGPT, is that something we think is empirically sound to do, but also normatively appropriate to cultivate in people? And I think a point of, I saw a connection with Brett's talk, the idea that we can use these interactions to somehow build our empathetic abilities correct against certain kinds of empathy biases, like compassion collapse, intergroup bias. And there's a lot of interesting promise for the future. And I'm going to skip over some of this in the interest of time, but it was wonderful to have Agnieszka, who is, still, I think, still on the call, some of her work on the intentional stance and choosing the intentional stance for robotic agents, I think nicely complements a lot of the, or our work nicely builds upon the work she's done already. We're really interested in thinking about how do we choose to empathize with human versus robotic targets. Um, and one of our collaborators, the philosopher Martina Orlandi, you know, raised this really interesting point. Like, how do we think about empathy in this context? Is it a category mistake to even consider that agent, the targets like this, which can't have sentience, 
He's thinking about terms like empathy or empathic accuracy, something that actually makes sense to ask him to, to think. And I'm going to uh, skip some of this, um, but this echoes some of the earlier points about you know, who are we to say with some degree of humility about whether if someone's having their needs fulfilled by AI agents, like how do we decide who has the epistemic authority to judge others for having their needs fulfilled? I think it's an open question. I think man, there's different perspectives in the room today that I think it really kind of fleshed that out a little bit. And we've been doing a lot of um, work with you know, choice-based measures where we give people opportunities to empathize with different targets, be they human, or this is the work we've done, you know, choosing to empathize or be detached from human targets or robotic targets like Pepper, Baxter, and Al. And it's work in progress. We find that it is heterogeneous and it varies in interesting ways depending upon how you present the choices to people, the words you use. It's a fact, that's a lot of where our head is at right now as a lab. And these are actually pictures we took of Helen's robots um, with his permission um, in his lab, but it's animating a lot of our work. And I will kind of skip over much of this because it echoes a lot of what we said earlier today, but I think there's a lot of open questions about whether we think, well, what are people's intuitions about receiving various pieces of empathy from artificial agents? And whether we think it's uh, worthwhile to cultivate, even if it's not real. And I think that really, for me, the really interesting question is how do we consider what people want? So I really am aligned with Mickey in thinking about the perception of what empathy we get from other people, measure that, see what people actively prefer and choose in terms of what they receive, and then have conversations to build upon those empirical findings to think about what are the normative weights. How do they change our moral capacities over time and our preferences and our abilities to empathically learn? And the quality of empathy, I mean, I heard this come up a little bit as well. Like, humans have plenty of biases that are problematic. And empathic inaccuracy, we've argued in our older work from 2019, is perhaps one of the biggest risks. The, the idea that if I choose to empathize with a stranger, the, the, the risk of getting it wrong and misreading their experience could be quite profound. And so, Perhaps something about these interactions can be helpful for us. And, you know, there are ways in which empathic AI can be helpful. I feel like we could have built this paper out into like a 40-page paper probably, but that's just not how ticks works. But there are so many fascinating ethical societal questions left to explore. And, again, I think one of the most interesting cases is how we can use the, these conversations, these interactions, to try to correct against various kinds of human biases. My work is in motivated empathy and empathy gaps. And if we can use these, this knowledge to somehow supplement our empathy and its limitations, I think that could be a really powerful tool. So I'm like between Z Doomer and whatever the other option was, somewhere in the middle. So with that, I'll leave you. Thank you all for coming to this. This has been fantastic. I love the conversations. And if you have any follow-ups, I mean, we have multiple opportunities for collaboration and extensions of these conversations. They're all, you know, come to dinner tonight. Um, it's at 6.30. Um, yeah, I'll see you there. Thanks again. <laughs>